What up? This is Josh Rubin from East West Alien Performance. Today is part two of Leg Length Discrepancy, another school of thought. Last time we talked about ligaments, we talked a little bit about viscera, we talked about maybe a tight QL, we talked about physiological lesions in the sacrum, you know, a right on, a left on left, on the left axis, it's rotating left, side bending right, and a right on right, side bending left, rotating right, what happens in the lumbar spine, and how we'll see a short leg or a long leg based on where the base of the sacrum is. Yes, the iliums are rotated, but in relation to what's going on at the sacrum. You would have to do differential testing to see if the sacrum is the issue of the anonymate. Now, of course, if there is an anonymate issue when you do your anonymate testing and, you know, you do position, mobility, you're doing all your testing, you find the sacrum's torsioned. You also find, for instance, let's say with your left on left, the right base is anterior, the um, left anonymate would be externally rotated or anterior. This is a right one, but just think left. So, of course, based on your differential testing, you find that maybe it's actually the anonymate that's the issue. It's not the sacrum. Now, the anonymate moves on three axes, like I said. A transverse axis, S3, is the iliosacral movements. S2 is the sacroiliac movements. S1 is the craniosacral rhythm of the PRM, primary respiratory mechanism. So you have a vertical axis as well, which is your inflare and outflare on the short and long arm, as well as your uh, tr um, uh, resultant axis, which is oblique, um, which gives you your full external rotation, which is an anterior rotation on the long arm of the sacrum milium, which gives you your anterior rotation and outflare. So it kind of gaps the short arm per se, I'm exaggerating it. And that's your external rotation. Now, of course, there can be an issue with the bone, one of the three bones, the, the iliac, pubis, or ischium that could cause uh, an anterior rotator of the ilium. Of course, the muscles can cause the anterior rotated ilium, but a lot of the times when we just look at kind of the meat suit per se, I think we're really looking at the repercussions of what's going on at a deeper level. That's just my take on it, based on who I've worked with, what I've done, and what I see with people coming in, you know, getting that work. I'm not saying it's not beneficial, but you can't just always loosen the psoas and think the ilium's going to pop right back up. It just doesn't work like that. Because it could be the coxomoral joint, it could be low and internally rotated and adducted, causing spasm in the adductors. That could cause an anterior rotated ilium. It could be a compacted knee that, that's causing the issues, or an internal rotated femur at the knee that's causing the issue. Um, it could be an issue in the long arm of, you know, this, this um, uh, of the iliosacral joint, where it's actually not uh, releasing. So we could say it's kind of blocked, per se, that's where the lesion is. Or it could be a lesion on the short arm where it's actually not becoming unblocked, and it's actually not closing, so we can't get a posterior rotation. It could be issues with the uterus. It could be issues with the um, broad ligament, uterosacral ligament. It could be issues with the pubis itself, which has an AP axis with the sacrum at S2, which is the lipocot point. So it could actually be more of a pubic issue, a lesion in the pubis. It could be anterior inferior. It could be posterior superior. I'm sorry. Yeah, po posterior and superior. It could be trans uh, rotated or torsioned. So it can actually be an issue in this bone that's causing an issue in this bone. But just because you see an anterior rotated ilium on this side it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to see something happening here. It could actually be just something with this bone. <coughs> so, of course, we have to look at <coughs> excuse me, look at this anterior rotated ilium, which is a factor because as the, anterior, the ilium rotates anterior, the coxomoral joint actually drops low and internally rotates. A lot of the times, yes, you get spasming or increased tension in the lats, iliacus, sartorius, rectum, adductor brevis, and longus. A lot of the times you get some tensioning from the outflare in the glute medius, minimus, TFL, and piriformis. Um, because the coxomoral joint drops and it becomes low and internally rotated, you're going to get spasming in the adductors. You're going to get spasming in the QL on that side. It pulls the 12th rib, um, and it can actually pull on the iliac itself. Um, at the same time, lost my place here, my train of thought. Um, at the same time, you're going to have lack of space or you're going to have a decrease in space under the inguinal ligament because of the anterior rotated ilium, because of spasming of the muscles, because of tensioning in the iliopatelial band, which can put actually more compression in the femoral nerve for more artery, etc., which can lead to lymphatic issues, circulatory issues, etc. So 
it could be issues in that area causing a uh, tensin in the inguinal ligament causing per se the anterior rotator ilium. So that's your most general view of the anterior rotator ilium, which can give you a false long leg discrepancy. But just because it's anterior, it doesn't mean it can't go posterior. And if it does go posterior based on your testing, then we know that we don't have a true long leg length discrepancy. Now, I kind of rushed over that because I don't really want to talk too much about that. Um, because, of course, it can be many mechanisms. That's the most common thing people look at, the anterior rotator ilium. And I'm really doing this, as I mentioned, to talk more about the sacrum. So another issue of the sacrum is, like I mentioned, you can get what's called a non-physiological lesion, but it's still respective axis because it's still on the oblique axes. And what happens is now, instead of the sacrum kind of rotating forward like this, it actually rotates back. It lesions backwards. So instead of rotating forward, so this is left on left, this is a left axis, based ILA. It's rotating forward and down. I'm exaggerating it. It's side bending too. Now it's actually going to torsion backwards like this. So it's an opposite. It's non-physiological because it doesn't do that in gait. So let's say we have a right on left axis, meaning it's side bending left, rotating right on the left axis. It's normally supposed to do a left on left meaning side bend right, rotate left on the left axis. But now it's side bending left, rotating right. So now what we see is we see the base go posterior and superior, and the opposite ILA actually goes anterior and superior. So we get this kind of torsioning backwards. So now the difference is with this right on the left axis, the base is posterior and superior, where with the left on left, this base was anterior and inferior. So now it's non-physiological with all respective axis with respective axis because this doesn't happen during gait. Now with this right on the left axis, which is that side bend left rotate right, what you're going to see is tightness in the right piriformis because the piriformis on the right maintains the left oblique axis. The left piriformis maintains the right oblique axis. So you'll see tension in, in the right piriformis. That doesn't mean you need to release the piriformis. Yes, you might want to work on the fascia and the piriformis after you work on the sacrum to help normalize it. We have to question why is why is this happening? There's many factors that can create this, and a lot of times it can actually be the bone that's in lesion. So as I mentioned, with this right on the left axis, so it's rotating right, the right base moves posterior and superior, and the left ILA moves anterior and superior. Now Things happen a little bit differently in the lumbar spine because now, according to Fryat's second law, because we're actually out of gravity, what's going to happen is L5 is going to side bend right. So let me preface this with, so now we have a side bending left, rotating right. We have that uh, right on the left axis. L5 is going to side bend and rotate to the same side, the sacrum side bending to. So we have a side bending left, rotate right. So L5 is going to side bend left, rotate left. Now there's some... Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Some argument as to what L5 does. Different authors say it'll side bend and rotate towards the same side, which is Fryat's second law. Typically, S side bending equals R, so it's rotation, side bending and rotating to the same size. And some people say that L5 will actually side bend right and rotate left, which is the opposite of what this is doing, which is Fryat's first law. And that can't really happen because this is not physiological. And Fryat's first law is physiological. So according to what I understand, this is a non-physiological lesion. So for, according to Fryat's second law, because we're out of gravity now, um, L5 is going to side bend left, rotate left, and the rest of the lumbar spine will actually compensate side bend right, rotate right, uh, to match the rotation of the, um, the sacrum. So what happens is, of course, now the ilium on the left is posterior, so we have a side bend left, rotate right. The ilium on the, on the left is posterior relative to the base. And the ilium on this side is anterior, right? It's anterior relative to this base because this base is actually posterior. So what do we get? Typically what we get is a false short leg on the left. That's the most common because the base is posterior. And this is the base in the ILA that we look at because it's on the left axis. Now, you could see a false long leg on the left, but with uh, a right rotation on the left axis, because this is the base we refer to and it's pulled backwards and superior, we're going to see a false short leg on this side. And this is paradoxical. Now, if it was a, 
left rotation on the right axis, side bending right, rotating left on the right axis, which is non-physiological with respective axis. This base is posterior. We're going to see a false short leg on the left side. So it's opposite. Now this is what I talked about in the first video. It's a little paradoxical because if the sacrum is side bending left, rotating right on the left axis, and it's supposed to do it on the right, now we have a false short leg on the right side. The ilium is anteriorly rotated relative to this base. You're going to see high iliac, low, at, uh, low ASIS, high PSIS. You're going to go, ah, they have a long leg, definitely. You're going to go check their leg, and a lot of the time, paradoxically, what you're going to see is the ASIS is going to be low, but what you're going to see is a shorter leg on that side. And it's a short leg because, differentially, the problem's not coming from the iliac. The problem's actually coming from the sacrum, and it's because the sacrum is rotated backwards or rotated right on the left axis, and it's not supposed to do that. It's not physiological. So that's another reason how you can actually end up with a leg length discrepancy. Other reasons that I want to mark off because I'm going down my list because this could be a three-part video is you have to think about a um, the vertical axes. There's vertical axes of the sacrum as well as the anonymate. And of course, vertical axes are vertical axes. They go through the long arm, the short arm, the center, etc. But typically with a vertical axis lesion, you're going to see a long leg or short leg depending on whether the lesion or dysfunction is, is in the long arm or the short arm of the sacrum or ilium. So of course if you have an upslip, a lot of times you're going to see a false short leg because everything is high. Um, ASIS, PSIS, pubis, there's slack in the sacro tuberous ligament, etc. So with, with an upslip, vertical axis lesion of the anonymous, you're going to see a false short leg, but it's an upslip. It's a traumatic lesion. It's actually off axis. Or a downslip, which is common, everything's now going to be low. ASIS, PSIS, pubis, there's going to be more tension in the sacro tuberous ligament. And you're going to see a false long leg net discrepancy, but this is a, a lesion of the uh, iliac bone or the anomalous bone, and it's actually off axis, so it's, it's a more of a traumatic type of lesion, typically from falls and things like that. It can actually happen from birth as well. Women can actually get down slips from uh, being in birth for too long and releasing too much uh, oxytocin, which creates uh, ligament laxity and laxity within the pelvic floor. So the pelvic floor and the pelvis kind of get pulled with the baby as it actually uh, gets pushed through the vaginal canal. So when you have a vertical axis lesion of the anonymous bone or the sacrum, depending on if it's on the long arm or short arm, you're going to see long, false long leg discrepancies or false short leg length discrepancies. Of course, if the lesion is on the short arm, you're going to see more of a short leg length discrepancy. If it's on the long arm, you're going to see more of a long leg length discrepancy. But remember, it's actually not a true leg length, it's an illusion, and it's a false leg length discrepancy. Now, another area to look at is the middle or AP axes. Now, there's some people believe there's only one AP axis that goes from S2 to the pubis, which is the lipocot point. And then some people believe there's more AP axis that go through the long arm, the short arm, etc. I believe there are, but I believe those are more lesional axes, they're not physiological axes. So the only physiological axis is actually S2 to the pubis. A lot of the times, whether whatever it be, if you believe there's one, you believe there's four, I don't really care. The bottom line is, a lot of the times when there's a lesion in the AP axis, the sacrum's basically in the AP axis, if it's going through the center, is going to do this. And a lot of times when there's an AP axis issue, you know, you're assessing it, you can feel it. A lot of the times it's from ligamentous issues, visceral, visceral issues, or fascial pulls, or scars. A lot of the times it can be traumatic. Um... Some people say that upslips are actually a lesion of the AP axis, and others say the upslip is a lesion of the vertical axes of the anonymous. According to what I've learned in my methodology, a lot of the times when you see an AP axis, unless it's traumatic, you're going to see an AP axis issue, of course. But a lot of the times, people that have women that have uter you know, issues with their uterus, so the uterosacral ligament at S2, issues with the bladder that attaches to the pubis, Trauma to the sacrum, trauma to the pubis at the same time because they have a huge fascial connection. Scars, episiotomies, issues with the prostate. You're going to see AP axis lesions. Now, of course, 
There can be other issues that are causing or facilitating this along with a dysfunction in an axis. Of course, it can be the quadratus lumborum, rex abdominis, internal oblique, external oblique, lats, erector spinae, etc. They can all have an impact on the iliac crest, PSIS, ASIS, all these different things, as I mentioned with the um, upslip or the downslip. But a lot of the times when you see an AP axis issue, you will find, depending on what I should say what side that sacrum is actually kind of rotated towards, you might see what I find, I should say, is more of a false short leg. But at the same time, what you'll find is huge losses of mobility in the pelvis, the sacrum, the hip, the knee, the ankle on that side, and tons of rigidity. Now, I'm not saying I'm a master at this, but that's what I've seen, is when people have AP axis lesions, typically visceral, ligamentous, or fascial, a lot of the times you'll see a false short leg or a false long leg on that one side, but it also depends on what side the sacrum, in a sense, is kind of um, rotating towards or stuck. A lot of times if you're listening to it, it'll kind of do this to one side or that to one side. Um, there's a lot of people say that sacrums, when they become embedded, etc., on the AP axis, but according to my methodology, if they become embedded or completely off axis, it's not on an axis anymore. But you can see false or short leg, the leg the discrepancies with any of these things um, if the sacrum kind of bends one way or embeds the other way. A lot of the times you'll see these false long legs or short legs, but there'll be tons of rigidity like I mentioned. So enough about that. Hopefully you've learned a little bit more. I'm going to do another video on this, part three. I'm going to talk about the cranium, the sacrum, and the link and how that can cause a leg length discrepancy. Peace.